every time I hear an ambulance at home, you know, I just stop and say a prayer, for, you know, for the person, whoever that is. Uh, you, you don't know, because it could be you. Gives you a total awareness, too. When the helicopter comes over to our house, you think, oh, somebody's in trouble. You know, something's going on. Yeah, what's the story? Tuesday, July the 24th, 2018, was a typical, quite normal day for us. Floyd had been in the garden most of the morning, and as we were preparing for bed, uh, I realized that he was short of breath and was gasping for air. And so I went to the bathroom, and was standing by the sink, then I started spitting up blood, and uh, they got me back in and put me on the sofa, and I remember sitting on the sofa, and I remember the paramedics coming in the door, but that's the last thing I remember. And they took him immediately out to the ambulance and put him in the ambulance. And one of the paramedics came to my car and said, he is actually having a very serious, massive heart attack at this time. And we followed the ambulance. And before we got to the four lane, one of the paramedics jumped out of the car, came back and said to us, the copter cannot land on the four lane. There's too much lightning and rain in the area, it cannot fly. We're taking him to Northeast Georgia Medical. And I said, are you sure that's the best place? And he looked at me and said, yes, ma'am, that's the very best place he could go at this point. They went through the emergency and went directly to the cath lab. They had been in constant communication with the paramedics on their way. So the team was in place and ready to go the instant that they got him to the cath lab, they began working on him. They put five stents in that, that night, and the team from the cath lab came out to speak to us. The only thing the doctor said was, we've done all we can do. It's in God's hands. He said, but you can thank the paramedics. They kept him alive. They saved his life and got him here in time. I'm often reminded of a conversation that was had with Winston Churchill. He was asked one time, did he know what it took to win the war? He said, I know what it takes to win the war, but it's not a matter of knowing what it takes. It's a matter of being allowed to win the war. The number one killer of Americans is heart disease. Over 600,000 people will die of heart disease. Over 370,000 or so will die from sudden cardiac death. A STEMI is a heart attack where the heart is still beating, but one of the arteries is blocked and must be opened quickly. Time is muscle. Every second that goes by, a patient having a heart attack is losing more and more muscle. Our STEMI system goes out 110 miles. How does a patient that's over 100 miles away from this hospital get the same rapid care as if they were just down the street? The boots on the ground know what it takes to get this done. Jason and I first met at our church. He approached me one day and asked if there were any uh, jobs at the hospital. I stated that they were going to hire paramedics in the cath lab. And that was he interested? And he looked at me, he was very excited, but yet quite perplexed. And he said, what do they do in a cath lab? An example of what Jason's work has done is, is um, quite remarkable is just the simple 911 call when someone is having chest pain. One of the first things that those first responders do is they get an EKG. And they can make a diagnosis based on the EKG if this is a patient that has a time-sensitive heart attack or a STEMI, an ST elevation myocardial infarction. In the past, when a patient had a heart attack, a paramedic would look at the EKG and say, yes, that's a heart attack. but all they could really do is, is drive faster, maybe give a couple basic medications. And Jason realized that, that, that we could do so much more. 
Oftentimes, a patient would have an EKG done. However, they would go to a local hospital that didn't have the means uh, to treat a STEMI. The problem with that is uh, they would often stay at that hospital for an extended period of time while they try to work out where they're going to send the patient to get transfer agreements uh, and to have another doctor or a cardiologist look and diagnose that EKG. This often took several hours. Even if they didn't get taken to a local hospital, what would happen is they would do the EKG, they would bring the patient here to the emergency department, the emergency physician and staff would look at an EKG and they would send that to the cardiologist. The cardiologist would ultimately determine that this patient was having a STEMI and needed to come to the cath lab. He had a vision that he wanted to break down barriers and deliver care faster to patients and bring it as close as possible to the patient when, when the diagnosis was made. They were becoming more sick and oftentimes people, people would lose their life because we just could not get uh, to them fast enough. Jason Grady with Dr. Marshall and other colleagues at Heart Center took this initiative over the course of the last decade to reduce the time of taking care of these patients because the faster they get to the cath lab where we do hard caths and open the blocked arteries with a stent, the better they survive, their heart muscle is less damaged and they have really good outcomes. We kind of take this as a relay race. And so if there's four stages of the relay race, the hospital is just the last stage. And what many systems don't focus on is those first three legs. We started to dissect each step uh, of the process. And we simply asked everybody that had ownership and contact with that patient, could they just shave one or two minutes off of how they treat that patient? And what we saw is those one or two minutes became five or 10 minutes and 15 and 20 minutes. And so in the past, if you were over a hundred miles away, it could be several hours uh, before you were able to come to the cath lab. And now in our system, we can do it in less than 90 minutes. There's a whole separate algorithm now that those paramedics can use that involves activation of the cath lab and mobilization of resources, but also the administration of medications to the patient at the time of diagnosis. That's so critical because in the past, they knew what the problem was, but we hadn't equipped them with the power and the resources to give those medications. We want to make sure that the cath lab is ready when the patient arrives. The only way that we can do that is for us to put trust in the person who has the eyes on the patient. If they call it a STEMI, well, we're going to call it a STEMI until proven otherwise. Years ago, that was not a popular thing. So they're treating the patients in the field, driving to the hospital, and once we confirm it's a heart attack, they don't stop in the ER for evaluation. They have a specialized elevator that goes directly to the cath lab where a cardiac team is awaiting them. We are ready with the lab open, so as soon as they roll, we start working and get the vessels open in a few minutes, I would say. We have people now that have heart attacks, and, and two weeks later, they can be back at work. That didn't happen 15, 20 years ago, but it does now. It sounds simple now, but in order to make that work and make it work consistently, required so much work by Jason to review every single case. When there are opportunities to improve, he would talk to the physicians, talk to the paramedics. People generally want to do the right thing. They often don't have the feedback uh, and the critique on what they did was correct or potentially even harmful or could they have changed anything or made a different decision. When a diagnosis wasn't made, he would review that and say, hey, why didn't you act on this? So really when I think of Jason Grady, I think of how he's broken down so many barriers to bring the best possible cardiac arrest and, and heart attack care to patients. It has to start with science first. It has to start with data. Uh, and it has to start uh, with uh, different trials. He's got the data of, you know, first medical contact to the first 12 lead. How quick did we transport them here? How quick did they go from door to balloon? Everybody holds ourselves accountable from the pre-hospital providers to the system here once we get here, and we're always trying to find room for improvement. In order to have full transparency with people, 
it has to be uh, encouraging. So people have to see that what they're doing is the right thing rather than just constantly being hounded with what they did incorrectly. And when people understand that what they're doing matters, then we have complete buy-in and that's when we can change a culture. We have people here that have only worked inside this system and the culture is, this is how we treat STEMI patients. After I had the heart attack, they told me I was in the 1% that survived the heart attack. And they also told me I probably would never have more than 25% of my heart. Now I have 45%. So the Lord has really blessed me and uh, he sent me to the blessed place. As Jason become more uh, immersed as a leader of the STEMI system, there are times now where you know his impact isn't felt on a actual patient level. It's more on a larger macro level, but he never loses focus on the why. We started very small and we worked with one county. As that became successful, we had other counties that came to us and said, you know, we want to be a part of this. And then we started what we call the STEMI Summit and we had 90 people. And this past year at our 11th annual STEMI Summit, we had about 1,400 people. It's not just the patients of North Georgia that have benefited from this, but it's people across the state and even across the, the, the Southeast. About six or seven years ago, we started to have these conversations of how can we get this care standardized a little bit better um, in Georgia? We have trauma centers in Georgia, we have stroke centers. Why do we not have designated cardiac centers? We were able to go to one of our legislators, Butch Miller, and lay this idea out of having these three levels of care, level one, level two, and level three. Uh, and so he liked the idea, he sponsored the bill, and uh, we were able to get this law passed. It's good public policy. And this year we should start seeing cardiac centers designated either a level one, two, or three cardiac center in the state of Georgia. We use a lot of his, uh, his way of breaking down barriers for other conditions now, whether it's trauma, sepsis, stroke, and we've worked to get standard processes in place that emulate the work that was done by Jason uh, for heart attack and cardiac arrest care. We don't have all the answers. We don't have the silver bullet. We just move forward every day with looking at what we're doing, evaluating it, changing, and remeasuring it.